Welcome back to the School for Writers podcast. I have a really great guest today for you. Her name is Susie Vitello, and she is my own developmental editor that I've worked with on books before. And she's the author of many books herself, including Faultland, out right now for you to get. And we're going to talk about that process. We're going to talk about why writing, how writing can legitimize your dreams. We're going to talk about the importance of a writing group and having people who, quote, keep showing up for each other. How great does that sound, right? We're going to talk about how you can find those people yourself as well. And we're going to talk about how Susie made it through hundreds of rejections and six years of edits to finally get her book out into the world and how having a solid group of people to support her along the way made all the difference. It's a great episode full of lots of really wonderful gems. So let's just go ahead and get right to it. Here's my interview with Susie Vitello. You're about to hear me chat with Susie Vitello, and we're going to talk about the importance of having people who continually show up for each other. When you're trying to get your book out into the world, when you're trying to write a book, when you're trying to build a writing career, when you're trying to persevere through rejection and be excited about those moments where you finally triumph, you need people who are there showing up for you, which is why we created School for Writers. Everything we do is around showing up to help support you and thrive. Everything we build is based around accountability and camaraderie. Because accountability and camaraderie are the foundations of a strong, healthy, thriving writing career, one where you find both creative and financial success. Which is why I am so beyond excited to announce that the School for Writers Academy is officially open. The School for Writers Academy is a all-in-one membership where you get access to me, a community of support, and all of my programs helping you to thrive as a writer. I used to offer all these different programs all over the place to help on plotting here and creating an email list here and the craft here and the career here and all of it separate. No. Now we have one spot where I can serve you time and time again, where you can get help whenever you need it and how you need it. Plus, it brings all of our communities together because you don't need some bits and piece pulled together patchwork quilt. You need one centralized group of people here showing up for you every single day where you can come and get your support and accountability that you need to keep writing. Sound amazing? It is. But best of all, it's not just like kumbaya and people cheering you on. In the Academy, you get my nine steps to thriving as a writer. You get the structural framework that I have proven to build a six-figure writing career for myself and help other people do as well. Because here's the thing, the world has enough broke writers. We need to get our butts out there and both write and make money. The Academy is brand spanking new and we start June 1st, but right now, right here, we're bringing in founding members. As a founding member, you not only get to help shape how the Academy will look and feel going forward, but you also get lots of added bonuses, expert advice, and people coming in and supporting us, and you get to be there live for the recordings that we do. Imagine coming to a podcast like this, hearing from an expert like Susie Vitello or Kavita Das or some of the other people that we've had on here, and you get to interact directly with them and ask them your questions. That's what the Academy will do. And... Best of all, we have breaks built in because we know that rest and reading and relaxation and creativity are all an important part of thriving as a writer. So what are you waiting for? Go right now to schoolforwriters.com slash academy and join because the world needs your story now more than ever. And because I cannot wait to read your book. Go get all the support you need to thrive as a writer at schoolforwriters.com slash academy. Once again, that's schoolforwriters.com slash academy. And of course, that's in your show notes. Hello, and welcome back to the School for Writers podcast. I am so excited today to have Susie Vitello here chatting with us about all things writing. So Susie, hi, and welcome. So excited to have you. Why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are and what you put out in this world? Well, thanks, Lauren. Thanks for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Yeah. Um, So I have been writing since I was in sixth grade and um, I have a few books out and I also coach other writers and have an editing business. 
Uh, my latest book is this one here. Whoops. Sorry about that, fellow. Um, Thoughtland, which uh, is my debut adult book. I've written several YA books, but this one is my first one for grownups and it's speculative. Um, and I'm really excited. It just came out last month, uh, a few weeks ago. So anyway, uh, but I also have a thriving coach bit book coaching business. Um, and I also do a fair amount of developmental editing and under the umbrella of this words in a hurry brand that I started uh, when I was actually worked in copywriting for businesses. So I just thought, well, I have the LLC already, so I'll just kind of, you know, even though words in a hurry isn't exactly my tagline at the moment, but um, but anyway, it all it all seems to work. I love that. I didn't know that, that it's called words in a hurry. Maybe I did know that, but I like knowing that now. <laughs> um, we're going to get into all of what you just described. I love that. You're like, Faultland, the book's out. Super excited about it. I'm currently reading it and excited to chat about it and writing groups and editing and all that lovely stuff. But first, I'm going to ask you the first question I ask everybody who comes on the podcast, and that is, why writing? Why writing? I think it's a way to legitimize my daydreams, frankly. You know, I grew up all over the world, started in Austria, moved to the States, and my, then my dad joined the Navy and we were all over the place. And it uh, and I um, became, as a compensatory device, I became a pretty good observer. And so for accents and voices and behaviors and gestures and all that kind of stuff, um, and I guess I just sort of legitimized it over the years and started crafting these narratives about the about people. And maybe that was the way that um, kind of helped me to fit in to new places and so forth. I don't know, but it's always been, you know, something that I've done. I, uh, when I went to college, I studied anthropology, which seems to me to be sort of a, you know, social anthropology is kind of just like writing in, in a way, you know, you're, you're learning about people and you're writing about people and all that kind of stuff. And that was exciting. But then I got mono and I came home and my dad said, so what are you going to do for a living when you graduate from this fancy Syracuse University? <laughs> You're totally in debt. And I said, I don't know. And he said, well, he's my dad's a doctor. And uh, and he said, why don't you do something in the medical field? And I said, well, I, nothing appeals to me really in the medical field, but um, I'll try dietetics. So I got into dietetics and, and I worked in hospitals for a while. Um, and then I got married, had a bunch of babies and you know, life intervened. Um, my husband died. I was suddenly widowed. I had these two little babies and I, uh, I, it was, it was kind of like, you know, if I had this weird opportunity because I suddenly didn't have a partner with which to discuss all the things, you know, and I just did a lot of soul searching. I thought, you know, if there's something that I want to do with my life and it's like 20, 28 years old at the point at that time, and I wanted to go forward in, in a direction, what would it be? And I thought, well, you know, I'm going to join a writing group and see how that works. See, see if that's something that, you know, it, that, that is going to be passionate enough to kind of sustain me and also somehow pay the bills. So I kind of backed into it that way. Um, did a little bit of uh, feature garden writing, you know, for like the, the glossy mags and yeah, just figured out a way to earn a living you know, um, doing what I love to do. Mm, found a way to do, earn a living doing what I love to do. That right there is gold, right? Like that's the dream is just like figuring out. I think you said, um, creating a, and I don't know how to say, is it pastiche, pastiche? I never know how to say. Pastiche, yeah, 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 yeah. Like how do you, is that French or is it like Italian? <laughs> 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 Spanish? Like I'm not it's sure. Like it's a sexy sounding word, right. what it is, but you know, to me, it conjures up a quilt, you know, and that's sort of um, what my uh, professional life has been. It's been this crazy quilt of different things and different opportunities and um, nothing that I set out for in a sort of, you know, what's your five-year goal kind of way, but opportunities kind of happened and, you know, Portland, Oregon, where I live, is a wonderful environment to do anything creative always has been since I've been here 32 years, I guess now. Um, and yeah, so, you know, somewhere along the line, I got an MFA sort of, you know, legitimized myself with a few initials at the end of my name. And then I did a fair amount of business writing and the business writing was really necessary because I had to pay for my MFA. 
right? <laughs> you know, and the adjunct stuff just doesn't really cut it when it comes to the paycheck. You know, at that, po at that point, I had three kids and I was a single mom and, you know, um, yeah, anyway, so I did that and, um, but kept writing, kept, you know, with the writing group and kept doing the creative pursuits and tried to get an agent, finally got an agent, finally sold the book, you know, all of that. But it took years and years. When I hear sometimes people going, I've been writing for two years and I don't have an agent or a book, I just kind of like roll my eyes because it, you know, for me, it, it took a decade and a half. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I have those friends or those people I've heard of, at least most of my friends are, are telling this story, right? Like it's been decades of working and working. And then I have the occasional person that I meet. They're like, oh yeah, you know, my first book, I just got a big, big deal. And it went huge. I'm like, congrats, you won the lottery. Yeah. But the, the way I think, yeah, I mean, correct me if you, if you disagree, but the way I think you become successful as a writer is to just keep writing. Like the goal is to set yourself up with enough success that you can keep doing this thing you love. Yeah, tenacity, it's, it is really about tenacity, you know, and rejection is just, it's absolutely part of the deal. And if you can look at it as an opportunity to see, you know, what's the next step you can take as a writer to um, not get those comments anymore, you know, then that's great, that's a win, that's school, that's education, like your, you know, like, like your, um, website right <laughs> yeah right yeah yeah it is it's an ongoing thing there's no sort of end because even when i had published books there's no guarantee that the next one is going to get picked up right yeah. so um so you know it's 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 an iterative process and and you know the other thing is that i think as an author you grow and you evolve and you change and so does the world so what you want to write about and what fascinates you and how you sort of see things, you know, that continues to evolve too, because we're dynamic, uh, you know, living creatures. So, you know, um, sometimes you can be glad that your first efforts weren't published. <laughs> it's funny you can't you say stand that. behind them quite the same way anymore, you know? It's funny you say that because just this week, the first magazine that I had my very first column with just went curve magazine just went and opened all of its like everything all of its archives used to be under a pay um, <laughs> pay wall and everything yeah. and my old columns about i had a sex column about my sex life while i was in law school and oh. i was like dancing burlesque in portland on the weekends and i went to the university of oregon for law school so and like during the week i was trying to hide the fact that i was like dancing oh. naked in portland oh for money on the weekends and writing about it for a magazine and, and all of those articles just became behind the paywall so everyone can read them again so i went through and was reading them and i was like oh, I am such a different person now. And that my very first book that I went through like the whole process with and eventually got rejected from publishers, but I had a high end agent and everything. And I was so excited about having all of my sex stories out in the world. And now I'm like, thank God, I did not have to go on tour about my sex life. <laughs> you know, and, and had that happened for you, your life would be in a different trajectory. I probably wouldn't be talking to you right now. Yeah. And you know, medium. It's, it's so interesting because really, you know, sometimes it just takes one little kismet thing, you know, twists it. And, and then, you know, then you become branded as this thing, right? Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's a whole deal too, with um, having written a lot of YA. I didn't start out to write YA, but there was a, um, a voice that was a, the voice of this teenage girl and I had to write her story. And so, you know, then all of a sudden I'm a YA author, you know, um, and, and plus I was raising teenagers at the time. So that was the voices that were, you know, that, that I was constantly surrounded by, but I was always fighting for that, uh, breakthrough novel that would get out there for an adult audience, you know, cause I felt like that's where more of my sensibilities lay in terms of how, you know, the, the level of irony that I like to put in my work and, you know, that sort of a thing, you know, felt, felt like it probably would be picked up better by an adult audience. So, you know, it took, it took a while, but that's, a, that, I love that story that you just told about <laughs> law school and dancing. Uh, yeah. I mean, one of these days I might make it like a, a like a, 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 I'm removed from it now. I can talk about it, but it was quite, <laughs> it was quite an ordeal. Um, one of the things you brought up that I would love to chat about this idea of like being afraid of being pigeonholed in a genre. So I talk to many authors that are so afraid of picking a niche, of picking a 
a topic because they're afraid of not being able to break out from that and that being the only thing they can do. And I have shared my advice on it, but I would love to know as somebody who just did that, who just broke free of that, what that experience is like and what kind of advice you'd give other writers about it. Well, I will say that I hate labels, you know, and um, it's really, and, and I've worked in branding before and I know how that wheel works, how, how um, commodification works in that way, you know, and how the bookshelves work and all of that kind of stuff. Um, so it is kind of hard, but coming from a place of not seeing myself as one thing or another thing, you know, I, I see myself in, in this sort of like um, ellipses, <laughs> you know, uh, I, I guess I, I guess I guess I feel like because I've only been published in small presses, it's not as big a deal. There hasn't been a publisher who's thrown a bunch of money behind me and has wanted me to, you know, be this certain way, right? Um, so, so I guess it's maybe, you know, I'm not, I'm not the person to say, oh, how do you, how do you do that? How do you fight against the man? You know, because there really hasn't been the man in my life, but, um, but I, I think that it's really important for all artists to really stay true to their own trajectories in their art and to be open to experimentation, to trying something new, you know, I mean, just to, to let your spirit evolve within your art and to, um, I mean, you do have to pay the bills, right? But if it comes down to it, maybe you find another way to pay the bills and just write what you want to write. You know, I mean, that's, that's, that's the camp that I'm in. Yeah. I, I was, I was reminded, I, I asked a panel this once and all of them said something similar. And I remember me being like, but I want to write what makes all of the money. And me being <laughs> like, do I know, like, do I want my writing to be the thing that makes all the money or do I want to have something else make the money so my writing can just be what it needs to be. And I think that as I get farther along as a writer, I appreciate the freedom of not asking my longer term projects, at least like, yeah, the thing I'm writing right now to like about the program, the course I'm building, the podcast, whatever I'm writing in my business is one thing, but asking like my novels to pay my bills makes it so I don't feel like working on my novels. There you go. Yeah. yeah. I, that, that makes so much sense to me because, you know, your projects that you really pour that special part of yourself into um, to really see them as a commodification, it's hard, right? I, I just think it's, you know, um, I really never want to be in that position. And I don't think I have to be at this point. You know, I, I, if, I, if I need to make <laughs> $2,000 next month, I'll find a way, right? <laughs> because really, it's not up to me in my writing, in my, in my books, in my fiction. You know, I don't have a contract in that way, right? So it's not up to me to put a number on that, but I know how to get the money in the bank if I need to, you know, it's just, you know, but it's not gonna be, you know, it's not gonna pinge upon that sort of sacred place. Yeah. You know, I actually have friends that do produce books rapidly for cash, like romance writers and erotica writers, mm -hmm. and they have kind of two separate parts of their brain in the same way. I'm like, okay, now I have to sit down and write an email sequence because that's going to get somebody into my program and pay the bills. They think of like, okay, now I'm going to write the next erotica on this thing because that's going to do the thing to write the bills. But I also have this like heartfelt project over here that I'm never going to ask to make me money. And I think that it's important to really understand like what your project's going to be. Is it going to yeah. be something for money or is it yeah. going to be something for creativity? And sometimes those merge and sometimes the creative thing will make you money or right. the money making thing will be creative. But I think taking that pressure off is so important, especially when you're just getting started. That's fascinating to me. I wish I could figure out how to do that because I, to me, it's, it's very compartmentalized. It's like, this is, this is the money part and this is the not money part. But if I, you know, um, I mean, I, it's not like I haven't considered doing something like that, but I, you know, I really have this barrier between those two sides of my brain. I really do. Every time I try to like stuff myself into a concept that has some, you know, that has a fair amount of rigidity, rigidity and tropes you know, to stick to, um, I rebel against it, you know, and, and I just don't follow the formula. And 
you know, and I get, I get mad at myself. It's like, why can't I do that? You know, why can't I, why can't I figure out that, you know, I, I could write a mystery if I, you know, I, or, a, or a, the seven points of the romantic comedy. Why can't I do that? You know, but yeah, it's hard. It's just not that part of my brain or my heart. Yeah, I mean, I I just, I'm with you. I want to be more formulaic in my writing because I think that there's there's that famous quote, like the sonnet structure sets you free. Like working within a genre can set you free. And right. yet I find yeah. myself struggling against that as I sit down and write. So sometimes I use those structures to like build the framework and then I just build my weird convoluted self on top of it and just, you know, see what happens. <laughs> Well, I will say that it's interesting because for me, the, um, the weakest part of my craft for my own work is structure. I'm really bad at structure for my own writing. I'm, I'm good at figuring it out for other people's writing, but when it comes to my own writing, that part of my brain that's engaged is not objective enough to see it the same way that I do as an editor, right? So, you know, it, um, so structure has always been my downfall, but with Faultland, I was so lucky to get published by Ooligan Press because that is a publishing program at PSU. And there are all, there's this whole team of people. And I went through, you know, the two years that I was engaged in this project with them, I went through a number of cohorts, but they were all so enthusiastic because they're learning to do this thing that they have passion for, right? So, um, so I had this whole team of structural experts, basically, who were learning, you know, the ropes and really engaged with that and they helped me with structure so much you know and i don't think i would have gotten that with a big press i would have gotten this big giant team of people that actually invented systems working on my book that's amazing oh my I gosh i just want to like i didn't know that about Uligan press i mean i'd heard of the psu had a program like that and i didn't know Uligan press was it so that's so intriguing yeah. uh, i would love to know why so you said you go work with a lot of small presses why small presses? Why not self-publish? Why not aim for the big people? What do you love about working with a small press? Well, I did actually self-publish uh, one of my YA books, and I, but I did sort of do this barter arrangement with a with a small press publisher here in town, Forest Avenue Press, Laura Stanfield. She helped me. Um, we did a trade. I did a. I think I did a developmental edit for her, and she did my interior of my book. <laughs> You know, so, but it is a lot of work when you're putting it out yourself. It is a lot of work and, and it doesn't, it doesn't really necessarily, especially with the um, kind of books that I put out, didn't really pay, you know, so it was time away from projects that were paying my bills. And so I had to be realistic about it. Um, I, and also, you know, I just don't think I had quite the skill set to, to do it uh, the way it needed to be done if I was actually going to earn a living doing it, you know, um, but the small press experiences that I've had have been with uh, people that are newer in the industry. And so they're using this particular press as as a, as a um, jumping off point, you know, a learning tool kind of a deal so in, in editorial and marketing in project management and all that kind of stuff. So there is a fresh vibe. There was an enthusiasm. You know, there there wasn't burnout, you know, and then with Thoughtland, half of it was done during the pandemic. So um, that was also a very interesting process. You know, I was because I was, uh, PSU, like normally the Ooligan program, you know, is on site, right? Like all all these programs and, and they actually sit in a room and they discuss what's, you know, what's going on. Well, when they did, when they acquired Thoughtland was actually the last couple of months of when they were able to do this in person. Mm -hmm. So they acquired it in November of 2019. And then it goes the holidays. And then, you know, they started to get back into it and then COVID hit. And then they all went their separate ways and did all of this stuff online. So I still had this wonderful team, but they were all kind of on Zoom calls you know, when they got together and so forth. So it was a, it was an interesting, unprecedented uh, time, you know. But the spirit of the small press is what I love. I really do because I think that there's a lot more leeway for um, things that aren't going to make a ton of money right off the bat, you know. That that have more of a, a select, smaller uh, potential group of of readership. Um, not to say that that's always the case. I think they took 
fault land on because they thought it would have wider appeal than some of the titles that they had. Um, you know, the earthquake, who doesn't want to hear, you know, read a book about an earthquake right? in Portland. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about fault land. Let's talk a little bit about this concept, because it's interesting, you just said that you you they took it on before the pandemic, because I assumed as I was reading it, that the pandemic had inspired it. And it you we weave like a, oh, I just I love that. So that was like, oh, because you weave. It's like post pandemic life. And you weave through that. So, so tell me a little bit about where Faultland came from. Yeah, well, I'll tell you some of the elements. Um, you know, I started the book six years ago. We were still in Obamaville then. You know, I mean, it was a different world. And uh, but I was always intrigued with this, and maybe just a little bit obsessed with the possibility of of the big one hitting here. You know, in Portland, and I live right at the base of this hill <laughs> that would essentially collapse on me. So, you know, it was always kind of a, gosh, you know, on my walks, I would notice the way architecture was and kind of think, oh, you know, I hope, you know, the earthquake doesn't happen because that, you know, that house is going to go right on top of that other little house and that sort of thing. But um, one of the things that I've always been fascinated with writing about are this sort of dysfunctional family dynamics and schisms. And I thought, gosh, that's a metaphor right there, you know. Um, you have a, a family with all these schisms, and then you have the earth with all these schisms, and then they, you know, they all kind of collide together and, and all of that. So, so that was the concept that drove it. And then we get into the era of Trump and some of the um, unrest here in Portland, and that continued to grow, you know, before the pandemic, right? It was, it was just kind of this growing thing. And um, I feel like in a way, Portland is a little bit like the canary in the coal mine, you know, um, it, it's just sort of this, this it, it, intense version of what's going on in, in the world, in the country, um, and just kind of compressed a little bit here and got a lot of media attention, had its, you know, media moment and all that. Um, and so I started weaving some of that in during my, you know, continuing drafts of it. And then I handed it over to Ool again, and they did, you know, their various editing processes. And the last uh, pass that they did and sent back to me was like last May, I think. So there we are in pandemic land. And I had the matriarch in the book who, who dies before the book starts um, die of cancer, but she dies in 2020, right? Because mm -hmm. I always had the book set in 2030. So I was like, wait a second, if she dies in 2020, you know, she should be, you know, it should have been COVID, right? So I kind of shoehorned that in. And then because of the nature of how we would live, I mean, we've had wildfires and, you know, it's been hard to breathe and all that kind of stuff. So the idea of respirators and masks and all of that kind of thing has always been around. Um, but then I thought, okay, so there, you know, like, now you look around and you see all these masks on the ground, right? It's just like litter has become masks, you know? It's like, it's ubiquitous. So I kind of wove in the whole, you know, extra masks or, you know, on hand and, you know, that's kind of thing. And so more and more of the politics and more and more of the um, COVID stuff found its way into that final draft. But it really, the stage was already set for something, you know? Um, and it just, you know, was a natural, uh, organic way for that stuff to come come in. It's interesting because I lived in in Eugene. I'm trying to like remember what city I was in, but I lived in Eugene. <laughs> I lived in Oregon for almost a decade, on and off. And um, I lived in Eugene about six years ago. And I remember everybody was super panicked about the big earthquake that would happen yeah. in Oregon. So when I was reading this, I was like, oh my God, I totally had those questions of, I like remember getting together with all my friends being like, listen, I'm from Southern California. You can't take earthquakes. Like you have right. to be seriously, <laughs> you have to have food, you have to water, like putting together prep pit kits for people. Yeah. And, um, yeah. So it really definitely brought me back to that like feeling. So the fact that you said six years ago, I'm like, oh yeah, that, that clocks, like everybody was talking about how, what we would do in the big one. Mm -hmm. And I, it's so great 
I've actually been in, I was in Mexico city for an eight point earthquake on a dry lake bed oh. right at the center of it. So I've been in one of those big earthquakes oh my gosh. down around you and you did a great job of explaining what it was like. Oh. I was reading this as like, oh yeah, this is exactly what it's like being in a massive earthquake. So I recognize saying that, that I am partial to this book already because oh. one, I was in Oregon when everybody was like talking about the big earthquake that could come and two, I've been in about four years ago was in a big massive earthquake um, and everything, you know, and I had to find my way home and everything. So I loved this book. <laughs> All of those say, I love this book. And I recognize that I personally connected to it, but I also think that it's, it's an interesting future glimpse at what could happen in the next 10 years. And it felt really viable. All these dystopian type things that happened felt very accurate. Like they could be happening or could happen. So yeah, it's a little bit of a perfect storm, huh? You know, I yeah. tried not to make it too negative because I always thought, you know, this family has to get their shit together. <laughs> Excuse me if I swear. No, you can cuss on here because all the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and, and come together a little bit more. That was always sort of the driving force of the book. Like I wanted it to end on a note of reconciliation. And obviously, you're not going to put Humpty Dumpty back together again overnight, right? So, you know, so that, you know, there's this epilogue that's like the six years later thing and all that. But um, yeah, I, uh, w you know, was in the spring break quake here. I live mm -hmm. in a, um, an old uh, Portland house and it shook like crazy. And my kids were very young men. And, um, you know, I, just that feeling, right? It's undeniable. You know what it is you know? And so, you know, it's four o'clock in the morning or something like that. And I jumped out of bed and I'm racing into my kid's room and I'm screaming at them to get up and get out. And, um, and my daughter is just like, she's, I think she was three or four. She said, I didn't do anything. <laughs> I was like, oh, you're not in trouble. Uh, we just need to get out of you're not in trouble. You're in danger. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, you mentioned that you worked on this for six years and you mentioned to me that you had hundreds of rejections. How did you keep going? Six years, hundreds of rejections? That feels like a lot of time and energy. Well, I would put it aside and work on other stuff, you know, um, and um, get some short pieces out there, you know, uh, and then I'd pick it up again just because I was so damn interested in it. I wanted to I wanted to do it justice. I wanted to do the story justice. I actually wrote a whole other manuscript about, you know, the big one um, that never saw the light of day that got rejected off the map. And so this Faultland is, you know, all new characters, all new arcs, all of that. It's just that the, the central thing that happens is the earthquake, you know, is this the, was the only um, similar deal. And, but I, you know, I think that if you really believe in a story that you've written, you might have to tweak it. You might have to, you know, change points of view or whatever. But I just say, you know, don't give up on it. I don't think you should give up on it. You, you know, the, find, get, get your beta readers, you know, um, get your feedback, be really honest with yourself about killing your darlings, what needs to go. Uh, you know, I don't know that you have to hire a developmental editor, but I've done that. Um, and, you know, for other for other books, I, I think sometimes just getting the clarity from an objective point of view, it could be actually the small thing that's derailing the whole deal. With Ooligan, they rejected Faultland at first, and it was called Cascadia, by the way, before it was called Faultland. They rejected it. And, you know, I was like, ah, you know, okay. And then two months later, they came back with a whole new team of people and this sort of I think it was like they were rolling out a new division in their um, curriculum that was a development. And so this new cohort came in and they dragged it out of the slush pile again. And they said, you know, we see some promise in this. No promises though, that we're gonna take it on in acquisitions, but we'd like to develop this further hmm. um, with you. So actually they gave me a full developmental edit. I mean, like, you know, for nothing, <laughs> right? And uh, and they, I think, because I had a many, I had too many points of view, frankly. So they, they said, you know, get rid of these, some of these points of view and this element of your arc, of your, of your plot, you know, um, arc doesn't 
doesn't work for us. And so I really, you know, enough time had elapsed where I could look at it more objectively. And as I will, <clears throat> excuse me, I was able to um, say, okay, you know, I, I think I can envision this without those points of view and without this particular element. So I rewrote a, you know, a big part of it. And then they took another pass through and then I wrote another draft and then they took it to acquisitions and they said, yes. So that's so inspiring because I see so many people who are like, I'm tired of editing. I'm tired of doing the thing. I'm try tired of doing the stuff. And I'm like, yeah, okay. I get that. I felt that way too. I definitely have books I've been like put away, but it's a reminder to just come back to it. If it's something that's keep calling you, right. like answer that call. Yeah. I've definitely written manuscripts. Like you said, that first one, I've written it and I'm like, no, that was good. I just needed to write it. It's out. It's not going anywhere. And other ones that just like continually call me even decades later. Well, when we were talking about how, you know, you can have two parts of your brain, you know, the money making part and the real creative part, you know, for me, if it was a money making kind of project, a project that I thought would sell well and, you know, um, do well, and I got rejected, it would be easier for me to let that go than one that was like, but I really believe in these people and I believe in this subject and I really, you know, I just, maybe I just need to get it deeper, you know, um, deeper connection. So, yeah. 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 How you are a coordinator and a uh, participant of a very infamous writing group in Portland. And I would love to know how does being a part of a writing group help you? Does it, do you feel like it takes time away? Like how does that, how does it support you through this process? Well, I have to say we haven't really met in quite a while. Um, and I think, you know, partly pandemic, but partly also we just moved in so many different directions, but we're in touch with each other a lot still, you know, we promote each other's writing and help each other in, in various ways. Um, but it was central to me for a lot of reasons. One was the discipline of meeting every, and we, we met every week, you mm -hmm. know? Um, so it was like having something prepared or at least being prepared to critique well, you know, um, it, it there was just this sort of, uh, like being in school, you know, it was homework, you know, this discipline. We kept showing up for each other. And that um, became something that just was a part of our life, you know. Uh, and I think that a lot of things got written that wouldn't have gotten written if I weren't part of that group. Um, because there, there was, there were times, very tough times, you know, this, these are accomplished writers and they didn't pussyfoot around with critique. If something wasn't working, they'd like, you know, you know, so it wasn't all kumbaya and, you know, pats on the back, you know, it was like, this didn't work for me, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. So you had to have sort of thick skin, but at the end of the day, um, you know, sometimes with you're, you're going to get that feedback anyway, even when your book's on the shelf, you're going to get readers at Goodreads or Amazon that give you a one-star review, you know? I mean, so if you're in this business, you're going to hear it. You're going to hear it all. So why not hear it at the beginning of your journey rather than after your book's already on the shelf, you know? It was, it, it just really um, helped with getting, getting deeper and better um, and faster, actually with your craft you know there's a little bit of competitiveness that goes on too about like well you know like chuck polinick can now write an entire manuscript in six weeks you know kind of thing so there is that you know it's like i want to know like, all your secrets chuck <laughs> <laughs> six no, weeks like, just give me give me like give me in between <laughs> yeah you know a lot of times i felt like you know i was i was sort of the the preschooler you know with with the <laughs> you know, with the, um, with the PhDs in a way, I mean, they're just so professional and such pros and so smart, you know, I just sit there in awe. Um, but I did a lot of the kind of den mom stuff, you know, um, little, little bit of OCD stuff going on. And I just wanted to make sure that we always had a place to meet that tended, a lot of people had young kids during this time period too. So, you know, th things changed and, and where we could meet and, and, and when, um, yeah, so, you know, and, and I also hosted workshops myself here in my home. I, I had a group, groups of writers come into my basement, um, and the pandemic put the kibosh to that, but, uh, 
Yeah. And yeah, this, this whole year has been such an anomaly, right? I mean, writers do tend to be solitary for the most part, but in Portland, man, you would go to a reading every week, you know, at least, right? There's just so vibrant and so many opportunities to be with other writers and to have to switch all that to online stuff was hard, it was really hard for some of us more than others. I mean, even just forgetting how to be social, right? You know, because writers aren't necessarily social people. So, um, you know, we're out of practice. <laughs> yeah, when the, we're going to be even more awkward <laughs> the right? next reading. We're not exactly dynamic people. It's like, going to be even more awkward when we gather. Like, is my shirt inside out? Like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, yeah. I'm not supposed to be wearing house slippers and sweats. Cool. Oh, oh the, I don't uh, even know how to wear yeah, pants yeah. anymore. I'm wearing <laughs> sweats every day. I have these like croc house slippers. I went to leave in this like fancy done up outfit I had for an interview, and oh. my sister calls it my pandemic mullet. It's like professional <laughs> on top. <laughs> <laughs> and I went to leave the house. My sister's just like, you can't, you can't wear that to the grocery store. I'm like, but I look good. She's like, look below your waist. Like, you can't wear that to the grocery store, Lauren. You have a hole. I can see your underwear. Well, you have your lipstick game on. Let me Thank tell you. you. <laughs> I, this is the only place I can wear lipstick because I have to wear a mask. Otherwise, right? I end up looking like Ronald McDonald if I. <laughs> I was wondering about like how's the lipstick industry doing? But I guess with Zoom, it's good, right? Yeah, lipsticks and um, heels. Apparently, like the sale of high heels has gotten zero now. Hello. I mean, right? I don't, I'm into my team. Like, right? I can't remember the last time I wore a pair of heels. <laughs> One of the things I loved what you said about your writing group is we kept showing up for each other. And I think that that's such a such an important thing. I mean, your group gained some, you know, fame and had some big names in it, but I don't think it matters. I mean, it does matter who's in your group, but I think it's so important what matters is, okay, these are people who are going to keep showing up for me and I promise to keep showing up for them. And I think that's really hard. So what are some of the ways that you were able to structure this concept? Like how do you find people or structure a group that's going to keep showing up for each other? Well, we're really lucky. Um, you know, the core group of us, was in a workshop run by Tom Spombauer and he was our mentor, right? So we had had this leadership and we had had these, this sort of stylistic guidance. Um, and then, you know, that um, went away because Tom got very sick for a while. So we couldn't meet with him anymore um, for over a year. And we sort of did a little spinoff and we just kept meeting Anyway, so, so we already had this sort of core group of people. Um, and then we expanded it to include other people uh, who were acquaintances of ours, who we knew were writers and weren't necessarily from that same, you know, background. Um, so it kind of grew, uh, but you know, it, you, you can't really have more than nine people. I think that's the most that we ever had was nine people. You know, um, but yeah, so so it started out as we were all students of this one guy. <laughs> I think that that's a great tip. No more than nine people, even when so I do a couple different writing programs that even when we have like large groups of people, we try to keep it to nine as well. There has to be something magical about that number because it feels like eight's a little too like eight and eight, six and eight, like six to nine seems to be that magical number where you can actually read each other's work and support each other in the process. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, we um, have pages for everybody who's around at the table. Like my job was always, you know, at the beginning of the day that we were meet was mostly Mondays. Um, send out that email who has pages and keep track. If there was too many people to get through, like we would take turns kind of thing. Like, oh, you read last week. So, you know, or someone would say, no, I, you know, I have to get this out. Um, it's due. You know, so please, you know, uh, I'll I'll give up my next three turns, you know, if let me read that kind of thing. So I'd keep track of all of that sort of stuff. Um, but we had pages, you know, and just the act of reading your work out loud to people that you respect was huge in terms of knowing, learning to know innately whether something was serviceable or not, you know, because you can, I mean, I'm somebody that, when I write, I sometimes talk to myself as I'm writing, like I, you know, I read what I'm writing out loud, but it's different when you're in that creative mode. 
that when you printed out the pages and you go to the workshop and you read it and knowing that there's this audience sitting there and so you're you know you've got your reading voice on and everything you can tell so many things from that experience that you can't just sitting alone in your office yes yes i go to i've been to writers camp with lydia and you could have mentioned oh, yeah. At uh -huh. Cheryl and Stephen, all of them that do the writers camp. And there is definitely something to being in a circle of people and like hearing their reactions to your piece mm -hmm. versus yes. just like yes. sending it to somebody and they get the feedback. And in my programs, we have these workshops where people like respond to your, and there's such a difference when you actually can like hear the re you, you can hear the silence. <laughs> you can hear the silence. Yep. You can hear the silence. You can see, you know, the scratching of um of pencils going on at all at once. It's like, uh oh, that's either stars or they they hate it. You know, <laughs> like you have that. Yeah, you're like, oh god, wait, is that a good scratch or bad bad writing, good writing? <laughs> right, right. And then there's, you know, the body language, and then there's the, you know, that that discernment of boredom. Like you just know they're bored. Like <laughs> you know, or excited, you know, it's, yeah. So there's so much that you can pick up from, um, you know, like just the physical business of a writing workshop. Yeah. And you can do it over zoom. It's so much better in person, but you can do it over zoom. So if you all are listening to this and you're like, well, I don't live in Portland. I don't have uh, this amazing writers community all around me. You can connect online with people. Um, you can find this yourself as well. Like this is possible. It can, I be, it can be done. I'm not particularly good at it. And I'll tell you why. Um, be, because, you know, if something happens technologically to one of the people, I just can't get past it. I have to fix the problem, you know, and then I'm just lost. I'm like I'm not present for what's important, you know. So if there's like nine people, you know, on your screen and somebody's fading in and out, like I just that's too much for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think actually when I do Zoom, I try to keep it to 4. I think it's really that's, hard. That's great. That's a great tip. Cuz then you can kind of like stack each other mm -hmm. and um and then I make sure someone else is in charge of the tech. <laughs> <laughs> that's the key. That's the key. Um, as I grow my business, the thing I keep trying to be like, I don't want to ever be in charge of the tech again, because when Lauren is always something goes wrong, like my clients laugh. They're like, does Lauren, is Lauren in charge of the tech today? <laughs> because there was, there was an error. <laughs> well, that's good to know. No, yeah. I, I think that's a great, that's a great tip. Yeah. Have your techie. Yeah. I have a, I have a 21 year old son living in my basement right now. It's like, hmm, there you go. <laughs> Make them do it. I cannot wait till my nieces are old enough for me to like hire them to deal with my social media for me. I'm like, here you go, make a TikTok video. I don't even know. <laughs> um, I would love to know how you transitioned or how you started working around writing and editing. So full disclosure, Susie Halt was a re developmental editor. That would That's what we would call it, right? Developmental editing. Um, I call them kind of more content edits, but yeah, developmental editing of one of my books that is still being pitched to publishers and agents right now. Um, and so that's how I got to know Susie. And you gave such really great, it, it, it was so interesting to me when you were talking about how you're not good at your own developmental editing because you did such a great, helpful job. Like my book has the structure and character development it has because of working with you. So I loved working with you. And I would just love to know how you got started deciding to be a developmental editor and to offer editing services. Well, you know, again, I think it just goes back to being in writing groups for 30 years, you know? I mean, the, the, the discipline of that and having actually, you know, um, had a master's program and, you know, and, and MFA and, and writing. It's like, there's a lot of that that happens, but I would say probably, um, working in business writing and copywriting for, for clients, corporate clients, um, got my game on pretty fast, you know, cause they want, they want the stuff and they want it now. They want it yesterday kind of a thing. So I learned to hyper-focus and to get into people's brains, right? To get into the client's brain. I mean, advertising seems like kind of, you know, um, sort of the anti-creative thing, but in a way, that's that's the whole deal is psychology of okay, so I've got to read this person's mind, you know. And um, so I think some skill set developed from that. And when I decided I didn't want to do business writing anymore, I realized, well, I've just got to find some clients, you know, to to pay my bills, right? So I, so I went and, you know, um, 
I think I just at that point knew enough people in Portland and I did a lot of pro bono stuff. You know, obviously in my writing workshop, we would do each other's, you know, we would, we would read whole manuscripts of each other's for free. So that, that's how that started. Right. But then when I, uh, I think I'm trying to remember, I think I actually got, okay, here's the thing. It's a niche. Um, some of my corporate clients were these older dudes who were like, wanted to write memoirs and they heard that I was a writer and they're like, well, I have a book idea. <laughs> so I started working with them and that was kind of how I, you know, how, how I guess I got the business, like realized that it could be a viable business. So for a long time, most of my clients were like these 70 year old men who wanted to write their life story. And, um, and they were fun, you know, I have to say they were fun because, you know, they, they were, they were coming of age kind of in the sixties and, you know, they, they would revisit that and, you know, all of that. And um, yeah, so I started and then it just kind of grew. And again, it's, you know, one of those organic word of mouth things. Like I don't really advertise or anything. It just has been this wonderful synergy that work just seems to come my way. I mean, I, I do put out a newsletter and I do, you know, I do that, but yeah, I don't know. It's just, um, it's, it's very gratifying, Lauren, to work with you and with other people on their passion projects. It, it's really, to me, it's as exciting, if not more so than working on my own stuff, you know, and it's a good compliment. I love that because I think that there was like a a younger ego side of me that thought that I had to be the one always telling all of the stories. And if I did editing or I did helping other people write their stories, it would take away from my own creative beauty and genius, you know, that part of me in my twenties. And as I, as I got older and I got in my thirties and now reaching my forties, I feel like the more, the goal is stories being in the world. Right. And, and I love what you just said about editing. Like you get to help people bring their stories out in the world. And that, that's beautiful. And you helped mine for sure. Like I felt a lot more confident after, after us working together. So that was, oh, I'm glad uh, to hear that. Thanks. So grateful for it. So I have a couple last questions for you. And these are the last questions that I ask everybody when they come on the podcast. And that is what is a book and it doesn't have to be the ultimate book, but what is a book that you've read that changed your life? Mm, oh yes. What is a book that I've read that changed my life? I'm looking around my library because I have a shelf with, you know, like the, the most significant books. I will say, you know what, even though she's in my writing group and I shouldn't, you know, it's like, oh yeah, she's in your writing group. But um, Lydia's chronology of water for like, for so many people that that's an important yeah. book. Right. But it, it, I think that it's beauty and it's um, genius lies in the understanding of emotional chronology in putting together a narrative. And um, so for me, even on a, on a craft perspective, you know, that book really changed my life. But on a, on a under, like the way that she's so honest and reveals so much about herself without it being sentimental, um, you know, it was, it was a game changer for me. It's one of my go-to favorite books that I'll reread. Mm. When I'm looking for uh, just um, a way to go deeper with prose, whether it's mine or a client's, you know, I'll bring it up a lot when I work with other clients that are doing memoir in particular. I'm going to have to go reread it again. The Chronology mm -hmm. of, uh, of Water by Lydia Yudkinovich is, mm -hmm. is the book. That's beautiful. Yeah, I'm going to have to go read it again. That just inspired me. I just finished my book <laughs> that I read. So I just finished oh. all end. So I'll have to go start another one and I'll go get that. Um, mm -hmm. And then my second to last question for you is what's a book that you want to read, but you don't want to have to write? Oh, so many, <laughs> so many. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I, uh, I, well, okay. So I'm reading Detransition Baby, you know, which is a very complex, dense novel. Um, and it's, and it really illuminated, uh, um, the like a subgroup of people that you know the the issues and the politics and the social awareness and all of that kind of stuff um I mean it's not that I wouldn't want to write it I couldn't right I'm not part of that world at all but um but it 
uh, so, so there's that book um, as a recent one. I think a lot of, I really am a fan of Tom Parada. I love the way he writes. I love how he takes um, the sort of darker aspects of human nature and weaves them into narratives that don't feel dark to me. Um, and, I, you know, I used to want to write like him, but I realized I will never achieve that. So I've kind of let go of that. It's very actually refreshing <laughs> to not be envious sure, of yeah. just, you know, like, um, but anything that he writes, like I'm dying for him to come out with it, a, a, you know, a new book, you know. Um, Who is that again? I missed that name. I don't know if Tom Parada. Um, his, hold on one second. Okay. For those who are watching the YouTube, you can see the holding up of Tom Pratt. Oh, Mrs. Fletcher. I'm holding yeah. up Tom Pratt. Yeah. Mrs. Fletcher. Fletcher. Now I feel like a jerk that I didn't remember the author's well, name. Well, that's his, yeah, that's, that's a more recent book of his. Um, but, uh, it, it, what I love about this book, is there's two points of view. One is first person. One is third person. There's a, um, a college, an 18 year old boy and his mother. And they kind of weave back and forth these perspectives. And so I love the fresh micro taste in you know, a text of, of um, the psychology of a mother who's about to be an empty nester and who is recently divorced and all of the sort of psychology behind that. And for a dude to write that um, so refreshingly, I thought was amazing, you know, but it like, I, I wouldn't want to do that myself like right um from a divorced dad's perspective let's say you know I, I don't think I'd want to enter that um yeah. cabin, you know that place so much so those were great answers <laughs> I love it I great thought out answers I love that and then my final question for you is if people want to know more about you and engage with you more what's the best way to get a hold of you and to interact with you more yeah, so I'm on Twitter a lot. I tend to be a little political. It's my name with an underscore between my first and my last name. Um, that's my handle there. So I do interact a lot on Twitter, I think. Um, at Facebook, I basically post pictures of my grandson. <laughs> I don't do a lot of interacting on Facebook, um, but I have a website and the website, uh, suzyvitello.com. And so there's the editor thing you can put you know press the click the editor side or you can click the author side you know so it's like right that's the page so um and and there's ways to get a hold of me through through my website too i love that and i'm going to just give another shout out to your amazing editing skills if people are looking for a developmental editor i um, highly Thank suggest you. working with Susie. and i highly suggest grabbing yourself a copy of faultland from Uligan press it is a really intriguing book especially if you've ever wondered what you would do if the big one hit so, and how that would affect your family that already has its own, its own earthquake within it, um, like most families do. Well, thank you again for coming on and so generously sharing all of your wisdom and knowledge with us. And I just really appreciate getting to chat with you here today. Thank you, Susie. Well, it's been a pleasure, Lauren. Thanks for having me on. This week's School for Writers book recommendation is The Culture Code by Daniel Coyle. And I read this when I first started thinking about wanting to have my own company that was surrounded by the culture of writers. And I was trying to want to build this, this academy and this group and this schooling and these communities and this camaraderie and how to bring about a culture of support where people can feel like they are a part of something bigger, how people can feel like they're loved and welcomed on a grander scale, and how people can feel like their input matters. And I love the culture code, whether you are an entrepreneur or you're somebody working in corporate, it outlines such a great example of what it makes a culture. What makes the difference between working at just some random place and being a part of a bigger, greater mission, a bigger, greater goal? I love that it starts with telling you that the number one thing you have to do is make people feel safe. And that is so important to me, these safe spaces. No, there's not going to always be a safe space. You're not going to find a perfect ideal place where nothing bad ever happens. But what do we, how do we create a place where you're allowed to say your opinion? You're allowed to talk and speak your truth. Here's something, the quote from there that I really loved. It was, 
You know the phrase, don't shoot the messenger? In fact, it's not enough to not shoot them. You have to hug the messenger and let them know how much you need that feedback. The way you can be sure that they feel safe enough to tell you their truth next time. And that is just one amazing gem in this book, The Culture Code, The Secrets of Highly Successful Groups by Daniel Coyle. I think that as we live in this capitalistic world, where so much of what we do actually in technology, especially these days, kind of separates us from each other, makes us feel like we're cogs in this wheel of capitalism. The Culture Code talks about how you can break that cycle and instead create communities within whatever you're building or creating. So whether you're starting a writing group or you're starting your own business or you're a part of the corporate culture that you want to transform and make even better, I highly suggest grabbing yourself a copy of The Culture Code by Daniel Coyle. And I highly suggest you grabbing a copy using the bookshop.org slash school for writers link that we have below for you. That way, not only do you support a local independent bookstore when you get it, but you also help support the School for Writers podcast because that's our affiliate link. And I also listened to this on audiobook and really loved it. So if you're an audiobook fan, we suggest using Libro.fm. And if you use the link in the bio, not only do you also support a local independent bookstore, but you get a free audiobook and we get a free audiobook. So it's a win-win situation. Once again, this week's recommendation is The Culture Code by Daniel Coyle.